So my name is Neil Murray, and uh, I'm an educator, a uh, reenactor, an amateur military historian, and a, and a collector. I like to I enjoy collecting uh, antiques and military antiques. Uh, I've been, I just started my 23rd year teaching in the Pine Plains Central School District. Um, and I also uh, work with the Living History Education Foundation. So I do, I do see Joe over there. So thanks for coming, Joe. Um, and thanks to the Dutchess County Historical Society for recognizing living history um, and my work. And, and I'm, I'm honored to be the, the recipient of the Eileen Hayden Award. So thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for asking me to talk tonight about living history as an educational practice. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, so just a little bit of background on how I got started. So this will make Joe feel, feel good. Um, I took a class back in 2005 at Fort Ticonderoga with Joe Ryan and the Living History Education Foundation. Um, and that course inspired me to, uh, to do living history with, with my students. And I, I started off um, by uh, doing mostly Revolutionary War living history, but that has kind of snowballed into almost every uh, era of military history uh, and, and beyond just, just military history, uh, using living history as, a, as a, uh, an, an educational uh, tool. Um, and you know, uh, I, I was further inspired uh, by my, my research and, and, for example, Stuart Lilly and the staff up at Fort Ticonderoga. Uh, and I'm going to steal Dr. Tatum's uh, phrase of the documentable past. Um, to, to really dive into history with as much accuracy as, as possible um, and to, to really kind of port, send the message that what, what we're wearing is a uniform uh, and, and not a costume. Uh, and I always joke with my, uh, my students that, you know, when, when we're doing our living history programs and our reenactments that uh, we're wearing uniforms and, and clowns wear costumes. And so not that there's anything wrong with a clown, uh, but clowns wear costumes, these, these are uniforms. Um, and just a little, a little more on, on, on how I, I started, my program started to evolve. Um, in the early stages of my teaching and, and, and a, a program that I started uh, based on what, what I learned from Joe, um, going up to Fort Ticonderoga and taking my students there in a 24-hour uh, overnight immersion, um, my high school principal came one year. And she enjoyed the trip so much. And we threw her right in the ranks. She was a private, just like the rest of the, uh, the, the, the students. And, and, and a student sergeant was actually giving commands to the, to the high school principal. So it was great. Uh, but the, the, my principal was so, so inspired by what she saw at the fort and, and what we were doing that she, she approached me to create, create an elective in military history uh, at the high school level and to use living history as the, the focus of that, of that class. Um, so to essentially uh, teach and instruct the class uh, using living history as a, as a method. So, so I thought that was great. And uh, my hope is that through living history, my students will make tangible connections to the past. Uh, stepping back in time, experiencing life through ideas, technology, clothing, and food that they'll actively learn by doing. Um, making connections to the past to help them better understand the cost of freedom. Uh, and I think it's important always to remember that living history doesn't glorify war. Uh, it's quite the opposite. Um, it serves as a daily reminder of the hardships of those who came before us uh, and local veteran stories and, 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 and veterans uh, experiences come to life in that way. Uh, my hope is that by utilizing living history as an educational practice that my students enjoy history. Uh, and that's a human story of our past. Uh, it's not just, you know, something that you view as unrelatable dates and, and names in a textbook or black and white pictures. You know, this was a world of color. Uh, it wasn't a world of, of, of paint and, and, and black and white, uh, that these are real people, uh, that they had human emotions and shared experiences that we can relate to. Um, and, you know, I, I always try to emphasize that it's, it's very important, again, to make sure we're not playing army, um, that living history really is something that, you know, if, if done correctly, you can not only um, have students earn, experience that tangible connection, um, but also you can earn the respect of local veterans organizations. And um, in Pine Plains, I've been fortunate to, to have earned the, the respect of the, 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 vet, the VFW and the American Legion. Um, and we've worked very closely with the American Legion and the VFW in Pine Plains, uh, the district that I teach in, um, being involved with a military timeline, for example, on uh, Veterans Day. Uh, on Memorial Day, we march in the parade and we have a 
pretty pretty neat and, and, and honored spot. Uh, this past year, my students uh, in Revolutionary War uniforms with their with their muskets uh, were actually flanking the color guard of the real veterans at, at the head of the parade, which was pretty cool. Um, and right behind the the, the real veterans uh, was myself. And, and my students uh, representing a military history timeline. So we've been, we've been fortunate to march in the parade uh, in, in Pine Plains. They've, they've invited me to, to dinners and I'm not a veteran myself, I'm, I'm, I'm an educator, um, but I've been invited to their, their, their Christmas dinners. And um, actually just yesterday, I got a phone call uh, from a, a um, Korean War veteran uh, who was in the Navy during the Korean War. And he asked if, if we wanted uh, some of his old uniforms uh to have to study and uh for my students to 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 look at and and i thought that was great and yet yet another example of of the power of living history and and how um if, if done right you can you can accomplish really two things uh in a sense one being the the, the tangible connections and that that very important uh learning of history but then the second uh is is a way for you to be involved with the the local veterans organizations which is which is very important um, and, and I would also like to thank the administration in, in, in Pine Plains, um, Tara Greve, my, my principal, uh, Dr. Handler, the superintendent, and Dr. Tim, the, the assistant superintendent, uh, as well as the Board of Education, because they, they support um, all of the, the living history and all of these things that, uh, that I do. So much so uh, that Dr. Tim and I uh, created a training last year um, where I worked with the elementary staff uh, to, to teach in-house in Pine Plains, to teach them how to uh, utilize living history as, as a method. And, and uh, with the Living History Education Foundation, we were able to supply them with uh, equipment and gear. And last year we had our, our first um, colonial program, um, revolutionary war program at the elementary level in Pine Plains. And it also gave my military history students at the high school level the opportunity to um, work with uh, the, the elementary school kids. So they, they got a real uh, kick out of that as well. Um, I'm a reenactor myself uh, of a number of different eras and uh, in much the same way that living history works for your students, it also works for you. Um, and I've found that reenacting different, different historic eras um, is a way for, for, for myself as an educator and a teacher to be more in tune and, and, and make uh, deeper tangible connections, um, but also as, as a form of research that, that directly translates back to the classroom. Um, and I've been fortunate to, to be a part of um, reenactments that have done that. Um, a lot of what I do in the French and Indian War era and the American Revolution is, is up at, uh, at Fort Ticonderoga. Um, and their programs are amazing. Uh, batoing, in a, in a, rowing in a bateau boat uh, six miles up Lake Champlain and marching to the fort or, or uh, hoisting a cannon onto a, a, a cart that's dragged by uh, oxen in the winter to simulate the, the Knox Cannon Trail or um, being out on snowshoes in 10 degrees and three feet of snow in the woods uh, depicting Robert Rogers and his rangers. Um, as, a, as an example of, of a few experiences. I, I was fortunate to be involved as a reenactor in the, the 150th um, Battle Commemoration of Gettysburg, uh, the 160th of, of Gaines Mill. Um, I've done some World War I reenacting at, at a place called Newville, uh, which was a pretty interesting experience. They have, uh, my understanding, is one of the, the, the largest trench systems recreated um, in, in the United States. And what an experience that was. And as, as fate would have it, uh, as soon as the reenactment began, it started to rain. Uh, then it started to rain heavy. Uh, and as uncomfortable as, as we were, because my feet were wet for the next three days, I was actually glad that that happened um, because it turned everything to mud. And I remember, um, uh, I think it was about dusk when they sent me out on a uh, a patrol, and I remember sitting there freezing with a raincoat and listening to the water plink off of my helmet. Um, and you know that that realism that really sets in is something that uh, you know is, is something only living history can kind of can bring to light. Um, but those types of experiences, as an example, are, are ones that we try to replicate with with our students. And living history doesn't necessarily have to be just military. Um, I know in Pine Plains, we have a, a very large population of the students who enjoy hunting. Um, so I developed a program where we talk about the um, Adirondack Victorian era hunting lodge or hunting camps. Um, and uh, that, that's a lot of fun. 
Um, and I actually was able to find on, on eBay of all places, um, a, a Buffalo plaid uh, hunting jacket and, and breeches. And then I bought the nice long like LL Bean boots. Um, and uh, so that's a lot of fun. And I'm a hunter myself. So I actually go out and hunt in that, that uh, um, vintage, vintage clothing, which, which, is, which, is, which is a lot of fun. Um, and in terms of the programs and the things that I do with my students, uh, we really kind of range in, in living history experiences from the, from the French and Indian War up through World War II. Um, so I thought I'd share a, a little bit of that with you. Uh, so there are many different impressions that, that, that I have as a reenactor um, that we then kind of translate into the classroom and different experiences. So in the French and Indian War, um, we will put on uniforms and go out and, and snowshoe um, and, uh, and obviously hope for snow. Uh, in the Revolutionary War, um, we do a local program at the Grand Brush House uh, and we also do an overnight uh, experience at, at Fort Ticonderoga. Um, War of 1812, I have a, a 15th uh, US infantry uniform um, where we're study the Battle of Plattsburgh. Um, and I recently uh, acquired a Mexican American War uniform. Uh, for the Civil War, uh, I actually have a 5th New York Zouaves uniform, um, a 63rd New York uh, infantry uniform, and a and 150th uh, New York infantry uniform. So uh, making those, those local connections. Um, World War I, uh, I have a 27th uh, infantry division uniform. And we have a big living history program where we go over to the aerodrome in Rhinebeck. Um, and my students are able to ride in a World War I ambulance. Um, and see those planes strafing over the trees and, and learn about uh, tactics of World War I and see kind of the mechanized vehicles and, and how they really come to life. And uh, the folks over at the aerodrome have been great uh, in, in supporting my programs as well. Uh, all the crazy questions that I asked, they said yes. Like, can I drive the ambulance? And they said yes. Um, so I think I was just as excited as my students when I jumped into a 1917 ambulance and they let, they let me drive it. Uh, and I always joke with uh, my students that I, I saw a meme or something one time and it's it had a picture of a car and it said anti-theft device and i had a picture of a stick shift um because nobody knows how to drive them anymore and i said well uh not only are driving stick fun but if you want to drive historic vehicles you better know how to drive a stick so i was fortunate that uh, i know how to drive standard and i could drive the ambulance because it's it's not an automatic um so that was a lot of fun um world war ii uh we we usually do a program in the winter and then one in the, in the late spring. Uh, in the winter, we've done two, two different programs. One, a Battle of the Bulge experience, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and a couple of years ago, I had a, a bunch of students that were very interested in, in, in skiing. Um, and my other passion besides history is, is skiing. I'm, I'm an avid skier. Um, and I, I recently um, got certified with the National Ski Patrol. So I was, I was really excited about that. Um, so what we did was we recreated a 10th Mountain Division experience, and I, I worked with the PE department, and I was able to, to get cross-country skis, um, and believe it or not, I found a pair of uh, original World War II 10th Mountain Division skis on eBay, uh, which I restored to, to skiable um, condition, and we went out behind the school and uh, skied, uh, wearing World War II uniforms and, and helmets and everything. Um, Another experience that was set in World War II was, was one that we did a few years ago, uh, set in the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, unfortunately, the, the, the veteran that we worked with um, is, is not well. I think he's, I think he's about 98 now, um, but, a, but a really neat program uh, and I, that I wrote about. I actually had an article published um, uh, about this experience in a, in a uh, uh, M1 Collector's uh, magazine. Um, but anyway, there was, we started the program by uh, speaking with a local veteran, um, Mr. Phillips, and, and Mr. Phillips, who's from Amenia, uh, and he was in the Battle of the Bulge. So to, for my students to be able to hear that firsthand and then go experience that themselves um, was, was pretty rewarding. And uh, uh, they, they, they talked about after the experience how difficult it was to, to dig a foxhole uh, in the middle of the winter. Um, we had shovels, and then Mr. Phillips shared that he had to dig his foxhole with wire cutters. Um, so really that kind of realism sets in and, you know, when they're eating, uh, cold spam out of a can in a hole that they dug, um, you know, in the middle of the winter in the woods, that, that realism really sets in. Um, in the spring, we usually do a, a World War II Marine Corps experience. 
and uh, another local local veteran uh, in Pine Plains who, who fortunately lives kind of right around uh, behind the football field uh, at the high school has a 1944 Willys Jeep. And his, his granddaughters were in my class years ago. Um, so uh, what we do with that program is uh, I usually go down and walk to his house and I jump in his 1944 Willys Jeep and he lets me drive it up to the high school. And then we drive it all around on the football field. And, uh, you know, again, need to know how to drive standard for that one. Um, but, you know, to be up close and to hear the whine of that Jeep and to be wearing the uniform, you know, and then in, in contrast to the winter experience where they're really cold, I usually wait for a really, really hot, warm, humid day to kind of simulate uh, the experience of the, the Marine Corps. Um, and, you know, even the food may be very similar if we're talking about a, a K ration, it's going to taste a lot different when, you know, the frozen chocolate is now melted. Uh, and the spam, instead of being, you know, like a brick, is now mush. Um, so it changes the experience, even though it's set in that, that same time frame. Um, so a little bit about what I'm, what I'm wearing. Uh, you know, in a, in a virtual program, uh, what, what, what I decided to do was to um, wear, wear one uniform, and I'll, I'll talk about how I use this one. Uh, and then, as, as I spoke with, with Andy and Bill and kind of organizing the program, I, I grabbed a few things, uh, just kind of as, as examples to, to, to show you, you know, how uh, objects and items in, in connection with living history, um, you know, can, can inspire students and, and for that matter, teachers as well. Um, so this uniform is, is one that I designed uh, that would be worn by an officer uh, who had recently graduated from the United States Military Academy and who had been fighting in the, the Indian Wars. You know, and, and the Indian Wars being an, an era that really is not typically covered in any sort of length in, in textbooks, however, interesting, important, and it, it really is, is a way to, uh, you know, introduce those difficult topics as we really look at our changing attitude and views towards Native Americans um, and African Americans, if we're talking about the, the Buffalo Soldiers. Um, so this is a Model 1872. Um, Cap Kepi with a with cavalry insignia. Um, the jacket that I'm wearing is a model 1872 officer's fatigue blouse. Um, and then I have shoulder boards of a, a lieutenant. Um, so again, a, a recent graduate from, from West Point. And, and, and making those connections to places local like West Point are important as well because they the students can relate. Um, and my district has been very good in supporting a field trip to the museum every spring. So, so we do have that as well. Um, but again, taking the uniform that I'm wearing here and kind of exploring a little bit deeper, you know, making those local connections, the West Point class of 1877, um, we see two interesting graduates, uh, Charles Gatewood, uh, cavalry officer who is very famous for helping uh, with the surrender of Geronimo, one of the most famous uh, native warriors. And then his classmate, Henry Flipper, who is the first African-American to graduate from West Point, uh, both serving in the cavalry uh, and both would have been wearing uniforms very similar uh, to, what, to what I have on. And I was just at West Point on uh, September 11th uh, for the uh, football game uh, and the cadet review, which was wonderful. And, and we parked at Buffalo Soldiers Field. So I was fortunate to see the, the brand new monument uh, that just went up on September 10th. And it, it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, and you know, wonderful to, to, to see the, the Buffalo Soldiers honored in that way. Um, so to show a little bit about and how you know, living history, whether it's the, the, the direct student engagement or whether it's items and artifacts and, and such that, that make those tangible connections, you know, we can even take a look at the, the uniform again that, I, that I'm wearing. And I, I said I had a fatigue blouse on. So fatigue blouse, you're on your horse and you are out uh, you know, on the Great Plains. You're not gonna wear, wanna wear a hat like this. So maybe you were wearing the issued hat which is a model 1872 campaign hat, um, which is pretty ridiculous looking, is it not? Uh, this was universally hated. Uh, and you know, I, I, my understanding, the reason being of how flimsy it was, um, I think some of them actually thought it was stylish, but I, I've seen a picture of, of Bentine who was with Custer um, wearing his hat almost like like that, as crazy as that sounds. So what was the purpose, the design of it? Well, you can open it up 
well, that's going to be a lot better on the on on the on the trail um, than than the Kepi is, right? But why do they hate it? Okay, and then we can have a discussion. We'll pass the hat around, and my students can see it, feel it, um, as they're wearing their uniforms and 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 and, and these, these similar hats to this, and they they realize, well, it's well, it's flimsy. Okay, interesting question. It's, well, what can you do? You can buy your own. So if you look at the documentable past and the pictures, what we see, sure, you'll see guys wearing this on campaign. You're not going to see too many wearing a kepi on campaign. And what we see pretty common are private purchase campaign hats like this. Looks a little bit more like a cowboy hat, more stylish. Uh, it's not as, not as flimsy, but it's a private purchase. So really, it's interesting and intriguing to think that as we, we look at the, the cavalry of this era, uh, we, or the army for that matter, we really see this, this gap between the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, and, and by studying uniforms, um, you can see that we, they really weren't putting too much thought, let's say, um, into what the hat might look like. Uh, and they have to go out and, and buy their own as an example. Um, some other things that I grabbed and, and uh, as, as Andy, Bill and I talked, kind of just a little show and tell, if you will. Uh, and so this, this is also a Kepi um, and this would have been worn by soldiers of the Fenian raid. Uh, another topic that's not usually covered in, in, in history books. So um, Civil War veterans, Irish Civil War veterans um, had this crazy idea that they were going to invade Canada uh, and force the British uh, to give them their independence in Ireland. Um, so they designed a pretty unique and interesting uniform. And uh, the, the uniform included a kepi uh, with a green band and, and a harp, right? So interesting to kind of spark conversation. Um, another example, and I, I like to try to find items and, and artifacts and uniforms that, that really are less common. Um, because another important thing for me is to, to dismiss the myths of American history, the, the romanticized history, um, you know, the, the, the parades and the fireworks of history, and, and really get down to, to the reality of it. You know, and, and even going back to the, um, the troopers and, the, and the, um, uh, the Indian Wars era, you know, uh, everybody loves Errol Flynn and they died with their boots on. Great movie, right? It's not real. Um, you know, or Frederick Remington and his impressionist paintings of a trooper. I mean, they're, they're great. They're phenomenal, not real. Um, but those are the types of things that can kind of spark interesting conversations. And if we jump to this hat, this is an example of a hat that would have been worn during the American Revolution. Uh, not typical of what you would see. Um, but this would have been worn by soldiers in the Hearts of Oak, uh, which was a regiment that Alexander Hamilton was a member of. Uh, and this is actually a beaver hat. I don't know if you can see that. Maybe you can see a little bit of the fur, right? So even that is an interesting conversation in and of itself. Nobody's wearing furry things on their head. Um, we've all read about beaver hats uh, in, in school. What did a beaver hat look like? Like that, that's a beaver hat. Um, we talked about the 10th Mountain Division experience before. Um, so I grabbed my boots. So these are ski boots. Uh, and they're actually original, uh, 1942 uh, U.S. Army issued ski boots. So they look like work boots. Interesting conversation to have when you say, nope, these are ski boots. And we do have a pretty large population in Pine Plains who, who, who ski. Um, so that kind of connection they can make to the sport. Um, and I mentioned the, the National Ski Patrol before and um, how that organization was instrumental in the 10th Mountain Division. But then also after the war, I mean, they're really credited with, with the creation of recreational skiing that we all love and enjoy, you know, and how can we kind of relate that back to living history and an object and an item? Well, there you go. Um, there's, there's a pair of, of, of ski boots. Um, and during our program, I actually skied on these. So it can be done. Be careful with your knees, but it can be done. Um, to, the, to the Civil War, uh, making local connections, um, this was actually given to me, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see that or not. You guys see that a little bit? All right. So that is a CVD, um, which is a, a type of small photography during the Civil War, uh, almost like a trading card or a baseball card. Um, but that is of a, an ID soldier, a, a gentleman named John Hart, um, who was in the 128th New York, um, and he was from Millbrook. So pretty neat. And I was, I was pretty excited when, when this was, was donated to me to have a, a CVD of, you know, um, uh, a Civil War soldier, let alone somebody who we know who it is, you know, let alone the guys from Millbrook. 
So that really is, is usually exciting for my students and, and a way to kind of initiate and, and, and start our programs. Uh, I mentioned the aerodrome and, and World War I, uh, and, and, and also that living history doesn't necessarily have to be military in nature. Um, so when we do our World War I program, uh, we play baseball. So this is a, a reproduction, uh, but this is a reproduction of a baseball glove. Um, and I don't know if you can see the date there, 1910. So during World War I, baseball, this is what the glove looked like. Um, my sons are very interested in baseball, so I have a lot of fun. So when I play catch with them, I actually use this. So it works and it's interesting, um, but you, know, you can relate sport to that leisure time, um, to our national pastime, Cooperstown, you know, relatable to the Civil War, you know, in, in terms of its origin, no, no gloves during that era of baseball, but uh, just kind of another example of, of, of some items that we, we use in class. Um, also on that World War I note, um, here's an example of an, an original bacon tin. And this one, uh, regular bacon tins would have been used to have your, your, your meat and your, your food and your bacon in it. Um, but kind of as a, a starting point and, and an item that will, will, will initiate our program at places like the aerodrome, you know, I'll show them this and this is original. And this one is unique because somebody was using it as a candle. So I thought that was kind of neat, you know, and, and back to what I mentioned in the beginning of the program, these, these are human stories. They're real people. Um, they're making decisions just like we would, you know, maybe this soldier didn't need a bacon tin anymore. They needed a, a light and they use it as a candle. Right. Um, okay. So what, what I thought I would, uh, and my talk with before we start answer, uh, having you ask questions is to just kind of share some of my students' reflections with you so you can hear their words, um, but then also share uh, some, some reflections on um, you know, how my students have been inspired by, by living history. Um, I've had a number of students who have gone into the military, uh, some have enlisted, um, and one living history student who still stays in touch with me um, is just graduated from ranger school. So uh, he is a, uh, in the army, he's airborne, uh, and now he's a ranger. Um, I've had students who have gone through ROTC programs. Um, I've had students who have gotten interested in collecting and, and, and uh, uh, trading antiques, whether they be military antiques or simply, uh, Mr. Murray, I found this in my attic, what is it? Uh, something that may have sat in the corner or sat in the attic for you know, who, who knows how long. Um, Students have become historians and teachers, uh, which, is, which is very inspiring. But uh, I'm gonna read you some quotes. And these are all, uh, these have been compiled over the years um, based on the different programs, the different trips, you know, whether it be to, to Fort Ticonderoga or the Aerodrome or the Grand Brush has locally, uh, or if it's, you know, our, our Battle of the Bulge experience. Uh, but, but here are some of their words. There are so many things that we take for granted. This trip taught me to appreciate the liberties that I have uh, because they didn't come easily for everyone. Independence was won through the hardships and sacrifice bringing this nation to where it is today. The most educational trip I've experienced in high school uh, was this past weekend. I read the drill manual, but it didn't make much sense just reading it and even seeing the pictures. Actually performing the drills on command was a whole different story. I lived through the daily activities of a soldier of the revolution. And this gave me a huge amount of respect and gratitude for the soldiers and what they did for our freedom. What seemed like such a beautiful place today has seen more courage, more fighting and more suffering and more pain than I could ever begin to imagine. I thought of all the times that I complained about my house being cold during the winter. And then I remembered how utterly freezing I was. And in my head, I thought, my complaint sounded so ridiculous. As we learned about the American Revolution in school, I've always tried to understand what the conditions must have been like for those who were involved. I've come to realize it is truly hard to understand until you've actually experienced it uh, through living history. I was watching the fire outside the fort at sunset. There was still plenty of light to see, but you could tell night was fast approaching. As I marched, I looked at the fort walls and saw my shadow. Uh, there before me was an outline of a soldier with a musket. What was even more powerful to me was the fact that I could not see the features of the soldier's face. The shadow in the exact same spot uh, of some old, uh, soldier who had saw this exact same thing hundreds of years ago. That shadow took me back in time and I couldn't stop looking at it. 
for that moment in time, it was not me. I was the real deal, a soldier in the Continental Army during the Revo Revolutionary War, excuse me. Uh, that was very powerful. As sappy as this sounds, I actually cried when I got home. I'm not exactly sure why, but I think it was a mixture of relief and pride in myself and the men who fought in this country and the men who fought for it. This trip was very powerful and moving, just standing where real soldiers stood. I felt exhausted and sore. The men whose lives were like that for years had to be incredibly brave and strong-willed. This is an experience I will never forget. After morning arms and giving tribute, we marched away from the memorial. Then I was awestruck. As we looked back, the moon was shining directly on the stones and it was the only thing that lit up the night. A noticeable fog created an eerie ambiance. At that moment, I felt a deep connection and was saddened knowing how many of those men had laid down their lives. When the fife was played, it became real. I became immersed in the marching. Suddenly my feet no longer hurt and I was not tired anymore. All I could focus on was the fifing. It was truly a beautiful sound. It really got me thinking about the soldiers. It made me think about how they would have been hearing the same music I was hearing in the same exact spot. I had a powerful feeling come over me when we were saluting the fallen soldiers with the moored arms position. At first, I didn't realize the power and significance of what we were doing. I came to realize that Moore and Arms was very similar, if not the same, as a modern 21-gun salute. Experience that made me realize that we were honoring the dead right where they were buried in the same way they would have been mourned over 200 years ago. So those are just a few selected uh, reflections uh, that my students wrote over the years that I thought would be kind of a good way to, a good segue into a, a question section about what we talked about tonight and to, to give you an idea of the, the power of living history through, through their words and, and not mine. So, uh, Bill, if you want to help me out with the questions. Okay, very good. We are uh, going to ask people to put their questions in chat, although, uh, it's a reasonable size group. We may be able to, to allow people to unmute themselves. But uh, if you want to put questions in chat, I know uh, we got a, a point made by um, Rick Sodler first. Maybe we'll mention that. Uh, Rick Sodler says they're hosting a Revolutionary War Living History event at the Brinkerhoff House Historic Site in East Fishkill next weekend, September 25th and 26th. And they're inviting you, and I would imagine anyone, to join that event. So that is an amazing site and group at the Brinkerhoff House. Thank you, Rick Sodler. Uh, Thank you. Question from Andy Villani. How many students get to experience the Living History course in a year? Does it establish camaraderie in each group that lasts beyond the time of the course? OK. Um, yeah, uh, so the camaraderie part, uh, I, I was just reading over the student reflections again uh, in preparation for this program, and there was a number of them that mentioned just that. Um, there was one in particular, and it would take me too long to go look for it uh, to, to read it word for word again, um, but it, it was something along the lines of they had always heard about, you know, the camaraderie of, of soldiers in arms and, and that they felt a, a similar experience as they, you know, the, this collective experience of you know, whether it be the Battle of the Bulge or, or being up at Fort Ticonderoga, they felt that kind of bond. Um, so I, I did read some students who, who had, had mentioned that. Um, and, and how many get to experience it per year? Um, mostly it's focused on my military history course. Um, so typically that course is about, usually about 20 to 25 students per, per year. Um, and then, and that's for the, the really, really immersive program. Uh, but in terms of the smaller uh, daily lessons, um, that's 100 a year. Um, so, you know, for, for argument's sake, about 120 uh, a, a year. Um, and that's in addition to programs that I might be doing with, with, with Joe and the Living History Education Foundation um, or uh, evening lectures at Ashokan or Outdoor Education Centers. Um, and, you know, every one of those is a hundred or another hundred, um, or maybe it's 20 teachers that we're working with. Um, so I hope, hope that answered your question. It is amazing. I'm so glad you quoted uh, the students. That really 
is <laughs> very powerful stuff. Um, so I have a question from Andre who asks, how do you build a curriculum for your students? What are the other assignments and readings you give in between the experiential parts? Mm -hmm. Sure. Good. Good question. Thank you. Um, so, as, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, I, I've really gotten involved, in, and I'm going to steal uh, Dr. Tatum's words again of the, the documentable past. I think that's a, a good good way to put it. Um, so, before they're able to do any of the actual living history experiences themselves, you know, they'll be engaged in um, uh, primary source reading research. Um, but to, to to I guess answer the, the question simply. Um, for each era, they're, they're tasked with um, documenting uh, from head to toe with, with primary sources, whether it be for Civil War pictures, revolution, you know, runaway ads, um, but to document with, without a question of a doubt, uh, everything that they would have, a soldier would have had, you know, so taking again, if we're, we're studying the um, uh, 1876 camp Custer campaign, uh, and you want to prove that uh, a soldier would have had a hat like this, well, then you have to find a picture of one. And now you can check the box for the hat and then find an officer wearing this coat, uh, a picture of it or a mention of, you know, the, the seventh cavalry was issued uh, 15 fatigue blouses. Well, then you can, you've, you've documented it there. Um, World War One and World War Two, you know, we're, we're, we're using a lot of pictures or letters home. Um, so so the, the, the course is very research based um, as opposed to, to lecture based. Um, where, they're, where they're diving into those primary source documents to, to, to help us document everything that we do. Very good. Oh, there's a question from Christine about how the level of interest and how many girls take the military history class. What's the balance? Good question. Uh, the balance is usually 50-50. Um, and, you know, as I, as I talk with my students about, you know, what, what, what the course in military history is like, you know, I always explain to them that it's uh, um, not all not all muskets and, and gunpowder. And I don't mean to say that, that girls don't like muskets and gunpowder, um, but it, it's the it's the full spectrum of it. And, and I think that as we dive into food and, and clothing and weaponry, you know, and, and sewing um, and music, I think it appeals to everyone uh, yeah. as opposed to a, a select group, um, if that's the right way to put it but uh yeah usually, usually about 50 50 you know there's some years where it's lopsided one, one way or one way or the other uh and you know I, we do set up the class in a uh with leadership roles a sergeant a corporal um a, a quartermaster in charge of uniforms um and you know again those roles are filled by by boys and girls uh, alike very good uh there's a question uh from jody thank you for your presentation Refreshing to see your passion and expertise. Can you provide a list of field trips that you attend? Sure. Um, you know, it, I think field trips are something where I'm fortunate in Pine Plains uh, that we're, we're able to, to do a lot of them. I know other school districts um, might not have that luxury, you know, so maybe a, a good way to answer that question is that uh, a lot of what we do can be done right at the school. Um, sure, it's going to be more powerful if you're at Fort Ticonderoga, um, but it, it can be done um, and take the Battle of the Bulge experience. We do that right in the woods behind the school. Um, but anyway, to answer your question, uh, usually in October, uh, we go to the Grand Brush House and do a Revolutionary War experience. Um, and I'm thinking off-site trips. Uh, we go to the West Point Museum um, and hike up to the north and the south redoubt. Um, for Ticonderoga and, and the aerodrome would be would be the offsite uh, experiences. Um, the rest the rest is, is is on site, you know. And we're fortunate in Pine Plains as well that we have um, a pretty large property, including an area that has woods. Thank you. And I think it's a, maybe a good chance for me to say when we have the video of the talk up in a in a couple of days, uh, and we'll send out a, a link to it. We will keep that page live where we can post additional information from Neil to keep track with, of, of what he's doing with the students over time. So uh, maybe that will be of interest. Uh, question from Jim, uh, does your living history unit provide uniforms and equipment or is it funded through education system? Okay, so um, Mr. Ryan and the Living History Education Foundation uh, has been wonderful uh, with helping us with uniforms. 
Um, but then I've also uh, had district support um, and written grants. Um, so I, I, I guess all the above would be would be would be the answer. Um, but but Joe was the start with the with the uniforms for the Revolutionary War experience, the 18th century experience, and the Civil War. Um, but then when I started to do World War One, World War Two, um, those those were grants and and support from the district. Very good. Uh, comment that it's interesting that you can integrate history into other departments like phys ed and uh, 10th Mountain Division skiing mm -hmm. and uh, a nice tribute to former teacher, as I like, <laughs> I mean, my lot, Hayden. What makes for a just war? There's a question. Uh, thanks for your presentation, uh, Jim and Margaret Nelson. <laughs> um. Yeah, some of the other uh, departments we work with, the, the art department, um, my students have made flags. Uh, we've worked with the the, uh, the, the shop tech department. Um, last year, my students and I actually built a musket. Um, so we were down in the tech department working on that. Um, and uh, they've made, um, we've made ammo crates, boxes, you know, all, all sorts of things. Uh, and I, I actually work uh, pretty closely with the English department, uh, a colleague and a good friend of mine um, who for the past four or five years now has been coming on every one of our living history um, excursions. And I guess I couldn't take, I shouldn't take all the credit for pulling those wonderful quotes out of the students. That, that's my colleague in the English department with her writing prompts. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll use the living history experiences as a writing prompt. Um, and uh, it, it's a good way for the, the students to, to be able to write um, and to, to really pull out those, those emotions that uh, I, I shared with you. That's wonderful. We have some, just some complimentary uh, notes that was awesome and informative. I will say I often feel history is undervalued, but I think uh, it's often our own fault, our own fault being amateur historians and that we have focused too much on facts. And here you're using history for other means, right? It's like the, that helps uh, you achieve larger and bigger understanding. And that is very exciting. And I think helps uh, uh, people appreciate that history, especially local history can be important. So thank you, Neil, for doing, <laughs> doing sure. us a favor, those of us who dig around and uh, dig up some of the facts. Are there, um, any other questions uh, at the moment? Otherwise, uh, what uh, may I make to... a comment? Please do. Yes, yes. Uh, your, your resource. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Nice job, Pro Consul. All right. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> I, I really can't make any improvements on it. Nothing like being the old man watching the, uh, the frontline troops do their job so well. For the rest of you, uh, livinghistoryed.org is the website. On that website, you will find all the resources, numbers to reach us. Um, there is a 106 page manual on how to do living history, even a ranking system so you can do character based education. Um, and of course, there's a couple of videos of which you'll see Neil in, and you'll probably see me with Whoopi Goldberg, but many more years ago. But the resources are there, the foundation is there. And if I just may say, Neil, you'll appreciate this. I was with Governor Pataki uh, on Saturday down at a special thing in the city because I responded to 9-11 as a volunteer fireman. And the first thing he asked me, Joe, how are we doing in living history? <laughs> and I reported to him, we've been doing really well. So, but for the rest of you who watch this, you see the kind of teacher that is that when they grab living history and run with it, You've got the best in the planet, as far as I'm concerned. And um, I'm going to exit and shut my old man's mouth. But those of you who would like to talk to me about uh, living history and what we can do at the foundation for you and uh, some of the courses that, that Neil is teaching, he, he, he was modest today, he didn't tell you about. He and Christy Pasquale, another master teacher, uh, had teachers at at the Farmers Museum this summer doing living history. Um, so anyway, congratulations, Proconsul. Thanks, thank you, thank you for thank letting you. me speak. And the rest of you, thank you for listening to Neil because he's the guy in the front line. All right. Thank you very much.
Thank, thanks, Joe. And uh, Joe's, Joe's the president of the Living History Education Foundation. So, um, you know, resources and a, and, a, and a good way to start if there's any teachers that are listening to this program uh, would be to, to contact Joe and I, I'd be happy to, to talk with you as well. And uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, Joe's the one that inspired me to get, get involved in all of this when I, I took a graduate course with him back in, back in 2005. Um, so thank you, Joe. Thank good you, night. Joe, yes. And I, we've had a couple of very uh, supportive comments uh, or reactions to Joe's comments. Uh, and we will send out contact information. What we'll do is when we uh, post the video of Neil's talk, we'll uh, get some information from Joe to post there as well. And then we'll email that out to everyone uh, as, as quickly as we can. Good night. Um, all right. <laughs> so, okay, so you may be hearing from a few people. Well, well that's but, all right, that's fine. My, the, the foundation, the webs, the, uh, my email, livinghistory at optonline.net. Uh, phone number for the foundation, 914-739-0136. Talk to you soon. Carry on. Don't get carried away. I love people who get to the point. Excellent. <laughs> and, he, and he's gone. <laughs> oh, he's gone. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, if there's nothing else, and it's hard to top that, uh, we'll thank Neil and thank all of you, and then we'll be in touch over email so you can use this as a resource over time. Thank you very much, Neil, and everyone else. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.